So, better late than never. I finally received the retail version of the Z590 Talk last Friday. You have already seen some Z590 uh, videos on YouTube, but those have been made on the engineering sample version of the board. And engineering sample boards, they are never as good as the retail versions of the same motherboard model. So that's why there's no point on posting too much information about the particular motherboard model before it's finally released. But uh, yeah, so the Z590 Dark has been out for a while now. It came out well, it came out way too late, but it came out on uh, uh, July, so, uh, well, almost two months ago, like one and a half months ago, almost two months ago, and I finally received it. But, uh, yeah, so uh, I thought about, like, uh, unboxing, like, this time with you guys, and uh, telling about my personal, uh, like, experiences and thoughts about this board. Uh, Buildsoids PCB analysis video of this board is already out, so definitely go to check that out if you are interested in the very in-depth like details of this motherboard like some uh, like uh, very detailed things about the PCP and the VRM components and so on but there are some ideas I'd like to say about this board and what I think about this board so uh, definitely watch until the end if you are interested but yeah so these uh, EVGA motherboards they come out in a very simple packaging nowadays and I think it's quite good so no need to advertise all of the things on the uh, motherboards packaging like compared to some uh, like very old boards from almost 10 years ago like the Gigabyte X58 AOC which has like tons of advertisements on the packaging but anyway so Z590 Dark nothing really uh, special on the back side PCI Express 4.0 and so on so without further ado let's get this thing opened up and let's see what it comes with so that's the packaging of the board itself and so uh, okay so they seem to uh, this is definitely not a DVD so they have so quick installation guide that's the first thing you'll see when you open up this box so I think it's quite handy although I never really read the instructions which is not a good thing I think so uh, when we open this up we have the accessory kit and we have the motherboard itself on the bottom so uh, Let's quickly check what we get with the accessories, although I don't want to spread everything all over the place. What we have, we have some, these are the thermal pads that go between the M.2 devices and the motherboard's PCB, I think. So M.2 thermal pad. So uh, like in the previous models, like uh, Z390 Dark, Z490 Dark, Dark Kimpin, the motherboard's PCB will act as like some kind of a heatsink for your M.2 devices. You can put a thermal pad between the device itself and the motherboard's PCB under the device and it should help you to dissipate some heat from the actual devices. So those are those. You get plenty of them, it seems. So I'll put that to the side and we have some screws. We have two probit cables for the measurement points being pretty much the same since uh, X299 Dark and Z390 Dark and also they have been present on many uh, graphics card generations under the classified and Kimpin model, models pretty much. So we have those, then uh, I think these are the Wi-Fi antennas. I really like the integrated Wi-Fi on this board so when I let, let's say set up a Z390, Z490 or even the Z590 system I can connect straight to the internet without any ethernet cable, so I think it's quite handy. Not sure which uh, generation of Wi-Fi this uh, supports, is it the latest or the second latest, not sure. And then we have, uh, these seem to be, I think this probably comes with the, uh, these are standoffs, so this probably has the same uh, instruction uh, PCB thingy that has been present on the latest. EVGA high-end boards, mainly the darks, so you can use that as a test bench if you wish, although I never pretty much did. We have a case badge, we have uh, some more screws, okay, so we don't have a DVD anymore, so we get a very tiny driver USB disc. I think that's quite standard nowadays, some screws and a few SATA cables. So that's pretty much it for the uh, accessories. So let's move forward and let's look at the board itself. So here 
is the board itself. Let's see. Okay, so there's no there's no uh, there's no guide PCB thingy. Not sure. I think it should be included. Not sure. Okay, so it's over here under the board. Maybe we'll look at that first. So here is the uh, guide PCB thingy that also works as a test bench. This will uh, give you all of the uh, details of the board. I think it's quite handy. It has been around for some time now. So you can easily revert to all of the different parts of the board. So we have uh, LGA 1200, two sticks of DDR4, ProBit connectors, PCI Express. They are also marked over here. So X16 slash x8 and so on. I think this is quite handy and you can just put the uh, standoffs with the provided screws over here. So just screw in the standoffs from the back side and you can then just let the motherboard sit on top of the standoffs and you have a very basic test bench. But uh, the most important part of this whole thingy for me is just uh, the guide of the whole uh, motherboard. So I think it's pretty much it. So let's put this to the side yet again and let's look at the board. So here is the motherboard board itself. It's very heavy. So if you are, if you have already watched the video by Buildsoid, he already gave some negative feedback about the heatsink. It's very heavy and it's quite unnecessary. The VRM is so overbuilt for this kind of CPUs. It's uh, just a way too overkill for this kind of board and it adds a bit too much extra cost on the board. I really like the look though. I really, really like the mix of the uh, copper and the dark, like uh, the very black heatsink and PCB like uh, combination. So uh, I think, I think that that's pretty much the best looking dark board I've seen this far. So if we just go through the uh, main aspects very quickly, so we still have the very same 90 degree rotated CPU socket. So we have two memory slots over here. So this is again just one dim slot per channel design because that helps to reach much higher like clock speeds and tighter latencies and so on. It generally helps with the memory overclocking a little bit. Not so much nowadays compared to what it was before in the beginning. Like especially at the start with Samsung BDI based memories. At the very start, single slot per channel design really helped a lot. But nowadays, even the four slot motherboards have uh, been able to reach much higher clock speeds as well. But yeah, so uh, not sure how much the, uh, like does the VRM design itself differ that much from the previous models like the Z490 Dark Kimpin and the Z390 Dark, but they are 90 amp power stages. Definitely check out the video made by Buildsoid. He definitely knows so much about like PCBs and motherboards VRM designs. So uh, I really like his videos about these topics. But anyways, so let's peel that off as well. The heatsink design definitely looks better all around than uh, what it has been before. So we have the uh, three, I think they are full length, like three M.2 ports between these two PCI Express slots over here. We have the 24 pin over here on this, at this part of the board with two 8 pin power connectors. I would recommend to always plug in both of the 8 pin power connectors, especially when you are purchasing this kind of board and well it's very weird if you purchase these boards like the Z590 Dark and you don't do any kind of overclocking because that's what this whole motherboard has been built for. So uh, especially if you are pushing a 10900K or 11900K very hard even on water cooling or anything more serious than that you should always plug in both of the 8 pin power connectors. Here at this part of the board we have the uh, well, technically dual debug LED. The other one of these is the real debug LED and then that whole device works as a monitoring device, like, just like on previous boards. It ha it's quite accurate on voltage measurements, like if you want to measure different voltages like V core, memory voltage and so on. The, uh, on these mainstream boards, the, uh, the die temperature measurement isn't as good like on X299 boards because the die measurement 
at least what I know of, cannot go as cold what's needed on the mainstream boards compared to uh, what's needed on like X299 or the LGA3647. With X299 CPUs, we generally don't go any colder than minus 120 or minus 110. So uh, for those CPUs, the uh, existing direct dye measurement is enough. On X299 Dark, for example, the coldest temperature that device can measure is minus 64. The only purpose of that measurement is that if we suspect a cracked thermal paste, we can confirm it using the dye temperature measurement. So for example, on X299 Dark, if you run, let's say, a 10980XE or a similar CPU for max speed at like minus 110, on idle it should read minus 64, the coldest possible temperature. But then if your thermal paste cracks, it will start reading like minus 45 or even minus 38 at the same pot temperature of minus 110 or so, then you know you have cracked your thermal paste and you need to heat up, let the thermal paste resettle and then go back cold. Now with these CPUs, as these are soldered CPUs, we don't really need that function. So I, I have mainly been using the uh, uh, debug LED measurement tool for monitoring, let's say like uh, VRM temperatures or CPU temperature. It usually gives, if you monitor the CPU temperature, it will give uh, the same information as the CPU package temperature, which measured by like core temp or hardware monitor. Because usually the CPU package temperature is the same value as the hottest possible core. But it does work. It's, it's quite good even for just voltage measurement. The value is usually quite ac accurate. And uh, this is the USB flashback board over here. So you can, just like on many other motherboards, motherboard models from other vendors, you can put the desired BIOS file on an empty FAT32 or FAT16 format USB stick. Just install it there. You need some power on the board, like 24 pin and so on. And you need to press the reset button for like four or five seconds. But the difference on these EVGA boards to some other boards from other vendors is that uh, when you use the USB flashback function, it will actually start up the board. Like on Asus boards, like uh, for many generations, when you do the flashback process on Asus boards, it doesn't turn on the whole system. But that's how it works on EVGA, so don't get scared if it turns on the board during the process. We have two CMOS clear buttons on the board, so we still have one over here and one at the rear I.O. I personally, I don't really like the location of the other CMOS clear button over here because you can you can accidentally press this button when you are like benching on LN2 like when you are trying to reach for the safe group button or for the uh, power and reset buttons you could accidentally press the, C the clear CMOS button when the board is running and that's not something you want to do at all so I would personally maybe uh, move this from here to somewhere better location on the board we have tons of debug LEDs and two fan connectors over here. The uh, ProBit connectors are very good, like uh, they are really really good and they have always been good but I, in my case, that location for the ProBit connectors is not the best possible. Like if you have probably seen my setup for like over and over again, my main bench table, the uh, one of the fan holders that holds the 240 radiator with the fans in place, it's very close to these so I cannot actually, it's not easy for me to reach these ProBit connectors when this board is installed on my bench table. But that's mostly my own problem. If you have the board set up like this way on a bit on a table, you can easily reach for these ProBit connectors. And if the design is still the same, every second pin should still be a crown pin. And I think they are labeled on the back side if I'm not like completely mistaken. <sighs> nope, they are not marked on that side. Oh, it's, it's marked over here, so it's actually uh, a little bit different than before. So let me zoom you in. So here, if you look carefully, so here we have ProBit Legend. So here we have Ground Ground. Oh, wait, how, how is that actually marked? Two grounds, 12 volt CPU ground, VCCIO2, VCCST. Sorry, it's a little bit hard to show on camera, but the uh, ProBit the probit connections have been changed a little bit, but you can use these PCB markings as your guide. So uh, they are mentioned over here on top of the motherboard's PCB. <sighs> but yeah, so uh, otherwise very good, but I just don't like the location of those 
connectors but otherwise just fine. Now over here we have triple BIOS once again, much better than just a dual BIOS. So uh, it has happened to me many many times already that one of the BIOS chips gets corrupted for whatever reason. And that's why I even posted the video about resurrecting a motherboard with a corrupted BIOS with that separate external tool from eBay. I don't want to do that process ever again if not needed. So that's why a dual BIOS or better a triple BIOS comes in. If one of the BIOS chips gets corrupted, you can change to the second or third BIOS and recover the corrupted BIOS very easily. We have slow mode switch. This is only for like LN2 situations. So if you want to uh, remain stable for sure, you can flip the slow mode and it will drop the multiplier to either X8 or X12. So it's quite good. These are the disable switches for PCI Express devices and I think some of these are even the uh, M.2 devices if I'm not like completely mistaken but the main the main like notice is on the uh, full length PCI Express slot so if you have let's say two 3090 cards installed with custom water cooling and one of them goes bad stops you from posting you can troubleshoot like which of the cards is prevent is preventing you from posting so if we flip the switch over here and we find out that our second card is giving us issues we can troubleshoot that easily with these dip switches <sighs> then we have a usb 3.0 connector for your case i think this is i'm not like i have never used this particular uh, connector but that's at least what it says usb 3.2 i think that's for your case again u.2 ports we have eight sata ports in total and these top ones are again the third party Asmedia SATA ports. And yes, I have already used Windows XP on the Z590 Dark engineering sample version. The only difference, what I don't like about the way it's done on the CVGA ports is that we don't actually have IDE function on the Asmedia SATA ports, but we have custom AHGI drivers for the as media SATA ports and that's how we actually install like very old operating systems like Windows XP or Windows Server 2003 on these very modern motherboards from EVGA. It does work just fine but it's a little bit tricky but it's a lot easier to install those very old operating systems using an optical drive compared to a USB stick and that's the very reason why I keep one spare DVD drive a hand always. You can easily buy cheap like DVD discs, empty DVD R discs from your local store for these kind of purposes. But the rest six are just normal uh, SATA ports that go that are connected straight to the Z590 chipset. Many of the fan connectors on these ports are ro uh, rotated 90 degrees, so I think it makes the uh, cable management look much better, just like with the 24 pin as well as with the dual 8 pin over here. We have color-coded front panel connectors over here, USB 2.0 ports for your case, yet another fan connector, then we have the beep sound, or how do you call it? It gives you a beep when the, the post process is done and so on, and you can either enter the BIOS or it's ready to boot the operating system. And if we turn this board this way around, we can see, as we already checked on the PCB guide accessory, this is the only full-length X16 slot. So if you want, let's say, single card running in X16, this is the slot to go for. This one is X8. So we, if you run two cards, like two 3090 cards in SLI, you will have X8 and X8. And I think this is, I think this is X4. And this is connected straight to the uh, chipset. So this is like, this is usually the. Uh, port I use when I'm only doing like uh, 2D testing on with these boards like uh, even with these modern boards I generally just put a very old graphics card onto this bottom slot over here as it causes the minimum possible stress on the CPU and on the whole system. The uh, sound part is yet again separated from the rest of the PCB and I think it looks good and on these newest EVGA boards the sound has been very good even with very high uh, ohm headphones like 250 ohm headphones and so on this 
separate 6-pin power PCI Express power connector is pretty useless on these boards. You cannot overload the 24-pin with just two graphics cards. I don't think it causes any like harm to have it over here, but it's not something you absolutely have to plug in. But generally, especially if I test two cards, I still plug this in, just to be sure. Power battery is over here. So the way the VRM is connected on these ports is uh, so that the uh, VRM parts are over here and over here. The only question is how the uh, PCI Express slots are routed around this part of the VRM. But uh, definitely check out the video by Buildsoid. He has a better answer for those than what I do. And uh, if you look at the rear I.O. Like over here, we have this is very important, so we have a PS2 combo port. So if you want to use both PS2 uh, mouse and keyboard, you need to purchase a separate Y uh, splitter cable and it works just fine. Then you can use both mouse and keyboard. So you don't need a separate PS2 port for both mouse and keyboard to run both. We have two USB ports under the PS2 combo port. We have reset CMOS over here, but that's actually quite hard to reach. I think this is the first dark board that has the rear I.O. Uh, shroud already connected to the board. So I might actually remove this because I generally I want to reach this button over here even with my finger and now it's very hard to do because there's the metal, because there's the metal shroud around these buttons and these ports. But anyways, here are the uh, Wi-Fi antennas and I actually never installed these Wi-Fi antennas. They uh, work fine enough when the board is very close to the uh, router. If you are much further away, I think then you need to install the separate antennas. Dual LAN, four extra USB ports over here. Then we have display port, HDMI and 7.1 and 7 audio over here. So very basic. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the first dark board with the integrated IO like shield already from the factory. But for my use, I might actually remove this if it's very easy to remove. So I'll have to check that out. So they, so apparently they do have two external, like two accessory fans, like some mini fans over here that are pushing some cool air. I think they are pushing cool air this way rather than this way, but I'm not fully sure. But I think that's pretty like overbuilt I really like the design. I really like the uh, mixture of copper and very like dark schemed like Mufferboards PCB and the rest of the Mufferboards design. But if it adds too much extra cost, especially now when the prices of raw materials are going up, not sure if there's actually there's actual need because the price of this board cannot go too high. So that's seriously what I think. The main minus points of EVGA boards are the uh, relatively low availability, at least in European countries. It usually takes quite a bit of time before the motherboards come available in the EU. And generally, they are not the cheapest options on the market. Well, none of the extremely high-end boards, no matter which vendor, are, are that cheap nowadays. So all of the high-end boards, no matter which vendor you are talking about, they aren't. They are usually quite expensive, like the Z590 OC formula, the Maximus, 13 Apex and the Gigabyte Tachyon, they are generally all quite expensive boards. The design is after all very similar to the, to the previous models like the Z490 Dark Kimpin and even the Z390 Dark. No big differences whatsoever. At least I can't really point out any major difference. There are some differences like in the probic connectors and so on and in the heatsink assembly, but they are very basic in the end. I will be doing like a separate overclocking tutorial video and BIOS overview after this, so stay tuned for that. But uh, just let me know what you think about this board. Do you like this design? Would you buy this board for your own build? And let me know what you think. The only minus now is that it came out way too late, but so far I think the extreme overclocking part of this board is very good. Like if you watch the uh, overclocking stream where Kimpin was and also Jacob Freeman from EVGA, they only needed to enable the LN2 mode inside the BIOS and set the V-Core and the VCCIO to voltage and the system agent and they could easily go to full pot temperatures just like that. And 
the board already has some top scores in different benchmarks like I think Cinebench R20 and it at least had the Cinebench R20 and also a very good score in Geekbench and so on and we will be testing out this board more very soon and let's see if we can do any other top scores with this board. But yeah, I guess that's all you need pretty much. So you don't really even need four memory slots nowadays because you can easily get up to 32 or even 64 gigabytes of memory. You are just fine with two memory sticks. So I guess the best option for the biggest audience who are looking at this board right now would be two sticks of high performing Samsung B die based memories like dual rank B die. So that means 32 gigs in total, 16 gigs per stick. Honestly, if you ask me, this is definitely the best looking mainstream motherboard from EVGA this far. I really like the look and it should be also the best performing one. Like uh, for Sub-Zero cooling, it should be by far the easiest mainstream dark to get to full pot temperatures without any hassle or so. And it uh, should be pretty awesome. Like even Buildsoid said on his video that the post process or the memory training is, is extremely fast on this board and uh, that's pretty much true. So uh, it has very good performance. It uh, should be very easy to use. The only minus is the relatively bad availability here in the EU. EVGA has kind of forgotten us EU consumers, so they definitely should invest more in the European section. And also maybe think about the overall uh, production line more to get the to get the price down a, a bit more but those are just my like honest opinions about this board <sighs> but yeah so let me know what you think if you like to see this unboxing and overview of the much anticipated EVGA Z590 dark motherboard then please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel and yeah thanks for watching one of my videos once again and I will see you on the next one